Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, or good evening, I should say, if you're in the UK. Uh, we're here to celebrate the release of Mark Dillingham's brand new book, Rabbit Hole. I've got the British copy here, strangely, and Barbara has the US galley right there. We should be getting our US copy soon, but we do have some signed, sorry, this camera's faking me out, uh, some signed British copies of Rabbit Hole. Uh, I'll go ahead and put the link in the in the comments field if you'd like to order a copy. And uh, our good friend Karen Slaughter, fellow cat enthusiast, is here to do the program with Mark. And we still have some signed copies, or we're getting a new batch, I should I should say, of False Witness. And uh, here you go, all signed stylishly in green pen. Oh, oh, I did sign that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'll be uh, monitoring the Facebook comments field. So if you have questions for Mark or Karen or Barbara, go ahead and put them in and I will emerge from the darkness when Barbara summons me to ask any questions you might have. So anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Patrick. I never can decide if this makes me Merlin or Morgan Le Fay when I bring him up, but whatever. Um, Mark, Mark has been a friend for many years. He's the author of 17 Tom Thorne series and four today, five actually, standalones. I think it's so impressive. I love showing the um, backlist list in authors' books because it's just so cool. He's won various awards. Um, my favorite, my favorite. He's won the Sherlock Award for Best Detective Novel Created by a British Author. That seems almost oxymoronic, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, hey, I don't care. I'll take it. You know, I, I'll take it. I'll take any old award, even if it's for table tennis or, you know, foosball. I don't care. All right. Um, tell us what the Theakston Old Peculiar Award is, because you have been nominated for that. I think Karen's been nominated for that, too. Yeah, I, um, that's, that's an award that's presented annually at the Harrogate Crime Writing Festival, uh, which is sponsored by Theakston's Old Peculiar, which is a very famous British beer. Uh, and they, they sponsor the festival. And yeah, they give this award out every year. And they, um, I've been lucky enough to get that twice. And it's, it's a good award because also the public are involved in, in choosing the winner. It's not just sort of six people sitting in a smoky room. Uh, yeah, it's a, very, it's a very nice award to get. And we yes, should Karen. say... Old Peculiar is the beer. It's not two of the qualifications. No, although it helps if you are old and peculiar yeah. Uh, yeah. because they just think that's good branding. And yeah. that's maybe why I won it. Um, Never yeah, won it. Yeah. The extent's old peculiar because you're neither not, neither old nor peculiar, Karen. Um, well, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, an, it's a nice award and a very nice beer, I should say. Well, and, it's, it may, and it is voted on by the public, though. That's really important because it's all the readers out there who love crime fiction. So yeah. it, it might, it's kind of like the opposite of the Oscars. It's not, you know, just a handful of people. It's people who really love reading and who are just your audience and, and they're, right. they're great people there at Harrogate as well. They are. It always has a really interesting um, list of nominees. Few authors published in the UK and not the US, we might not know, but um, it's, it's very inclusive. Um, I've often wondered, does it come with beer? No, it, you come with, I mean, I'm wondering if you can actually see the awards. There's two of them behind me, those two barrels. You get oh, a kind it. of, yeah, you get a kind of handcrafted miniature barrel. Um, and last weekend at the, at the Harrogate Crime Writing Festival, which we were very happy to be able to put on again Ooh. as a live event, oh, it was just terrific. I got given a very special barrel. I got the Outstanding Contribution to Crime Fiction Award. Br brought so, by a Newfoundland, we should say. Huh? Brought by a Newfoundland with it under his chin. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. You, you don't get that. But that, you know, that's a list that involves, you know, Colin Dexter and P.D. James and Ruth Grendel and Lee Child. And uh, that's kind of that's kind of a special. That barrel's downstairs. I go and polish that quite regularly. It's a wonderful crime festival to attend. I have been to it a couple of times. And for those of you who are Agatha Christie fans, you might recognize that Harrogate is the place where during Agatha's often um, discussed absence. Um, no one's ever going to fully agree on why she disappeared, right. but we can all agree that she was found in yeah. Harrogate. Not, um, not just at Harrogate, Barbara, she was found at the Old Swan Hotel, which is where the festival is held. Um, exactly. And if you're lucky, you can stay in the Agatha Christie suite, which is kind of spooky, because there's lots of pictures of her everywhere and the eyes follow you around the room in quite a strange that. way. 
<laughs> I've actually been to the Agatha Christie suite at the Para Palace Hotel and also yeah. in S1 in um, the hotel where she uh, wrote Death on the Nile. So right. if you're a crime fiction fan, you can kind of do a pilgrimage of rooms that Agatha Christie stayed in and see if you can stay there too. Well, this year, case, this year we had, we, we did, a, there was a lot of Christie this year because it was a hundred years, right. hundred years since Mysterious Affair at Styles, or I think. So it was, you know, a big, big, big Christie celebration. We are delighted that Karen is going to be talking to Mark about um, Rabbit Hole, which I think is a great title, and is introducing a woman named Alice Armitage as kind of a, well, she is a police officer, but in dire circumstances. So Karen, I'm going to turn this over to you with the freedom to interrupt whenever I, <laughs> whenever I feel like it. Um, well, we should say, as we're marking anniversaries, that this picture, Mark, you, you told me this was 12 years ago today. 12 years ago this very day. And that's Sarah up. Waters and me and you, and then yeah. our friend Mo Hader, also known as Claire Dunkel. Um, so she's passed away recently. Yeah, she and, died. Uh, she died a week ago. And it's she, uh, talk about peculiar and wonderful, and one yeah. of my favorite writers in oh, the entire was, world. And just one of the, the nicest, craziest people you could share all your anxieties with. Um, and I actually sponsored her to come to America. She you, apparently, if you want to study or work in America and you apply for visas and things, you have to write a letter. And it was so tempting to talk about her necrophilia and, um, <laughs> you know, all the horrible things she's done. But I pulled back from that. And when I told her, she said she was very disappointed because it would have been worth it not to be allowed ever in America for me to write that letter. Yeah. Um, so we miss her very much. She had a, a yeah. wicked sense of humor, a beautiful daughter. Um, and she, she's a great author. So Barbara, I'm sure you've got a lot of Mo Hader books there. Um, I always say, if people think that I'm full on, the person who scares me is Mo Hader. Oh. Listen, she I can really believe that. Her first book was completely terrifying, but my favorite of all her books was the one she wrote about Nan King. Oh, I, I agree. Remember the I title, can. but the God, Devil in King. Yeah, it's yeah, been retitled it's worldwide now. When it was originally released, it was called Tokyo in right. the UK. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, and and the Devil of Nanking in the US. But now it's been retitled The Devil of Nanking, which is the title Mo wanted. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's a masterpiece. Yeah, it really and is. I just it, think it it's, ought a, to it's have a book more prominence you, than you'll the, never forget it. Yeah, yeah. It well, also more prominence in the literature of World War II, even though the siege of Nanking was, I think, 1935. But nonetheless, the Japanese were really going at it um, earlier in the 30s than, well, before Pearl Harbor, let me put it that way. And I think mm -hmm. that Mo just did a brilliant job. Karen, why in the world did she write that book? I mean, what, what was there about Nanking that interested her? Well, she was an escort for, like, not a prostitute, but, you know, the escorts that make rich, powerful men feel like young women want to have sex with them, but they don't actually have sex hostess. with them. Hostess. hostess. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, and so she, she knew that life. Um, and so I think that's really what she wanted to write about. But she loves secrets also. Um, and that book is a big secret. And actually, you know, as much as I love it, Mark, Pig Island always reminds me of you. Always. Oh, thanks always. Very yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, I mean, she she just wrote about what she was interested with in. And then, you know, she met Bob, her husband, because she had a, a character who was a diver working for the police and okay. But honestly, if you look at all of her books, you would just think this is someone who wrote about what they're interested in. Don't you think, Mark? And that she had a lot she, of varied interests. She had a lot of varied interests, but she was obsessed and, and fascinated by, by death and by violence against women. Absolutely mm -hmm. obsessed by it. She, she got very close to it on a number of occasions. Mm -hmm. uh, and while she, was in, while she was working in Tokyo, her friend was brutally raped. She watched three people die. She watched three people die in really close succession uh, and a good friend was murdered. And she became she became completely obsessed with this and was fearless. I mean, absolutely fearless. And she'd get to the point in a book where most writers would go, OK, I'll, I'll stop, you know, I'll pull away. And she would just dive right in. The other thing to say about her that I think is really interesting is that she 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 became quite reclusive towards the end of her life. Uh, she she didn't enjoy this kind of thing. She absolutely wouldn't 
do it. Um, and trying to get her to do an event was was like trying to get B.A. Baracus onto a plane. You know, she she would always go, oh, they don't want me. I'm rubbish at that. And, uh, you know, she would say she was antisocial, but she was just actually very shy mm -hmm. and she had a crippling stage fright. But when she did do events, I managed to get her to the to the Bouchercon at Baltimore. And she was kind of star of the show. She was absolutely sparkling. And she always was, but she just she didn't want to play that game. She hated doing it. You know, she yeah. just wanted the books to speak for her and spend time with her family. You know. Well, but remember her first tour in the US, she gets on the plane, and by the time she lands, someone has published a review. I, I don't remember where it was that the book is too violent. Mm -hmm. She shouldn't be writing about this. So she lands and her tour has been completely canceled. Right. Remember that? And so she's yeah. she got a few days for free in New York with a friend of hers. But I mean, that's a pretty startling thing to have happen, especially considering the book is, I would say, not any more than Thomas Harris, Stephen no. King. You know, it's and part of the problem, I guess, is because she just looks so beautiful. You know, she was a model. She was waif like and, you know, yeah, you just yeah. I think it was very disturbing for a lot of men to think this woman I want to screw actually has more potential for violence than I do. And she knows a lot more about it than I do. So I think it was yeah. like a, a double edged sword for her. Either way, it's a it's a real loss and yeah. stupidly young and from a hideous and horrible disease that, that yeah. moved way too quickly. And yeah, very, very sad. But anybody watching this who hasn't read Mo Hader, for God's sake, go out and treat yourself. Yes. Go read, you know, go read Birdman, which is her first book. Read Tokyo, Devil of Nanking. Read any of them. They're, they're yeah. all amazing. They're amazing. Pig Island, the Mark Billingham story. Why, do, do you're going to have to, why does Pig Island remind you it of me? The narrator reminds me of you. Because okay. he's just like, ah, you know, <laughs> shit happens to him. And he's like, ah, well, now I have a tale. Great. Okay. okay. You know? <laughs> uh, read that one read any of them but read yeah. read some mojada uh, yeah. you won't be sorry you'll Buy thank as many us as you can her 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 daughter needs it <laughs> okay so we should start now mark okay i think we should talk a little bit about you which i know you don't like to do um <laughs> you can tell i just took a nap woke up from a nap yeah. um when I, so you and i've started around the same time this is 22 for you though yeah i'm at 21 when you see that long list, Barbara was talking about, she's always impressed. I always think, fuck me. I cannot believe. Cause it's, it's like a ring in a tree. It's every year of your life. Yeah. And it's the entire page. So what do you think when you see that? I, uh, I mean, it makes me, it makes me feel quite old, but, but that aside, those of us like you and I, who are lucky enough to write full time. Yeah. I, there's kind of no excuse not to. I mean, you know, there are so many writers who we both know who still hold down, you know, in inverted commas, proper jobs, who are working as teachers and doctors and in bars and whatever, who get up at 6 a.m. and write for three hours, then go and do a day's work and then write again when they come home. And they still manage to produce books. So those of us who have got nothing else to do but look out the window all day, um, it, it's no hardship. I would I would not know what to do if I if I didn't have a book coming out. No. Um and I'm very suspicious of those authors who will take seven years to write a book. I'm thinking this better be the best goddamn book I've ever read, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's a book a year. And obviously we've been writing, you know, our first books both came out, what, 2001 or 2000, yes. 2001? Yeah. You did two so, in one year, though, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, no, not really. Not really. I think. Irish um, twins? Huh? You had some Irish twins? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, it. But, you know, if if after writing for 20 odd years, that page of, you know, previous publications had three books on it, then I'd be doing something quite, quite tragically wrong. Literature is what they yeah. call it. That's and right. You're, you're, so are you involved in Save Our Books over there? That's a, I'm, I'm, I'm a what? So are you signed on to Save Our Books? I don't, oh, I don't know. Oh, about the What's copyright? That? No. Oh yes, mind. no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's just just starting to be a big thing here. I got I got buttonholed about that at Harrogate actually a week ago. Yeah. So, yes. so yes, can you explain it a little bit? Because I know readers uh, don't understand the nuts and bolts of this, but it's a pretty important thing. You're going to have to explain it. No, it's an English thing. Well, it's... they want to take away your copyrights, basically. Well, I right? don't think it. No, I don't think it's quite. I, I don't know enough about it, Karen. I had a okay. two minute conversation with somebody and I know it's something that I should probably be jumping up and down about, but actually it hasn't, it hasn't made big headlines over here, even in the, in the book press. Oh, so, okay. 
Oh, well, um, we'll tell people to Google it. I'll move to okay. my next question. Okay. Um, so you're touring now, you're doing a theater thing? Like no, a, no, no, I'm doing it. No, not really. I mean, um, Harrogate Festival, which happened last weekend, was the first live event that virtually mm -hmm. anybody there has done in a year and a half. And there still aren't two. I've got a couple more in the diary, a few creeping up in August and September. But the tour I was talking about before we went live is a is a, a theatre tour I'm doing with Richard Osman early next year, where the two of us, Richard Osman, who wrote the Thursday Murder Club, the two of us are mates, and we just thought, let's have some fun. And we're doing a kind of comedy it's more about it's more about two of us having fun playing silly huh. games doing improv telling jokes whatever doing a little two-week theater tour early next year like uh mike diamond and adam horowitz just taking the show on the road just taking the show on the road and seeing what happens yeah um well that's where you got your start right is uh doing silly things in front of cameras and audiences yeah, yeah i mean i you know i thought i wanted to be an actor and i did that for a few years and then when that started to not when I fell out of love with it or it fell out of love with me, I'm not quite sure which is which. I drifted into stand-up comedy, which a lot of a lot of actors did at the time when they couldn't get enough work. Because there's not really much luck involved in stand-up comedy. You know, if you can do it, if you can get the laughs, they'll they'll book you the next month, you know. Mm. Um, and again, I did that for a long time until I started getting bored of sitting in grubby dressing rooms at 3 a.m. Um, and then started writing because... I'd always, you know, been devouring uh, mystery fiction. I was, I was like dipping my toe into the whole kind of crime fiction community just, just, just to get free books back then. You know, I was reviewing writers and uh, going to the festivals and the conventions and stuff and thought, sod it, I'll have a go at writing one. And, you know, and got lucky and, and uh, here we are. So you're that annoying guy who was always hanging around and then becomes I am. more successful. I am that annoying else. guy. I am that yeah. annoying guy who said, I'm writing a book. And, uh, you know, writers would... Uh, but no, I mean, I remember, you know, I, I so remember my first US tour. Um, and everybody's so nice. I mean, you know what they're like. Most, most crime writers are so nice and welcoming and supportive. And just because there isn't that thing of that there is in comedy, for example, there isn't that thing that, you know, in order for me to, if I'm going to do well, somebody else has to do badly. There isn't yeah. that. And, and the reason there isn't that is that crime readers read so voraciously, so voraciously, you know, because they read your book. It doesn't mean they won't read my book or Michael Connolly's book or Lee Child. They'll read everybody's book because mm -hmm. they read six books a week, you know. So Didn't you and I tour together on the West Coast. Yeah, we did some stuff together because we were with the same publisher way yeah, back then. Yeah, we and, were. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we did some, we did some, we did some shows together. We yeah. showed up and showed off. Got tens of people to come out. Tens of people. Tens of people. <laughs> so exciting. Oh yeah. Did you go to college? I'm the first in my family to drop out of college, so I like to ask people that. Yeah, I went to, well, I guess you, you're you talking about what we call university, yeah? Yes. Um, yeah, No. I, and I was the first person in my family to do so, um, to, to study, of all things, drama. I mean, I'm sure they'd have been much happier if I'd been studying medicine or engineering or, or you know. Something practical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> something, that, something that might be of some use. But no, I did a, a drama degree, which meant I spent three years pretending to be a tree and doing dance and wearing tights. Yeah. Uh, all, man all manner of nonsense. But I'm, you know what? I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. Uh, I mean, I, I think unless you are doing a vocational degree, mm -hmm. you know, like law or medicine, it's just about having three years of great fun and no responsibility before well, you. Well, so our uh, friend Lee Child did law. Then he mm -hmm. went into television. Right. So I practical mean, <laughs> use of that. Yeah, it, I'm sure he had a great time. Yeah, university. yeah. Well, he's a he just brings a party. Yeah. It, uh, what's the first job you were fired from? I'm not. I usually say, were you fired from a job? <laughs> I but I know these, these you are were. great. These are great questions. Do you know what? I can honestly say I've never been fired, but that's because I've never had a proper job, Karen. I mean, I, I, um, I, the only, the only thing approaching a job that I've ever had that hasn't been, you know, acting, telling jokes, or writing books, is I worked for one summer as a as a cleaner at a holiday camp. We had this chain of holiday camps over here called Butlins. Um, it's difficult to describe. Kind of a real British institution, um, and they have a thing called red coats which are the entertainers, you know, that put the shows on every night. And I thought that's what I was going to be. I thought they'd hired me as a red coat. And this was going to be my, my, you know, launch pad into showbiz and got there and I was a cleaner. And it was the most miserable, miserable summer of my life. They had at that time the biggest bar in Europe, the longest bar in Europe at this place called Minehead in Somerset. 
and you, you literally you'd stand at one end of the bar and you couldn't see your end. Oh. and at the end of the night two o'clock in the morning i had to carry all these ashtrays these huge metal ashtrays out into an alley and clean them with a power hose and I'm just getting like covered in, oh, it was the most miserable job. So I wasn't fired, but I, I kind of quit right. after about three months. Um, and that's the only proper job I've ever had, really. Um, never wow. been fired. Have you been fired? Um, I have put myself in a position where I have been such a terrible employee that I'm, I ended up hating the person for not firing me. It's like, why are you taking this shit off me? <laughs> you know? Right. Um, right. So that's usually, that was my MO. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that with my books. Not on purpose. But yeah, I mean, but I worked in a movie theater. I worked, I was an exterminator. I painted houses. Um, when I you just, say you painted houses, not not in a kind of no, the I didn't Irishman. murder people. No. Okay, fine. Just so when you were talking clear. about Mo, I, I did think the joke she would appreciate is maybe Mo was killing all these people, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, because, you know, you do wonder uh, with some writers, especially some we know, if they are secretly serial killers, because it would make oh, I wouldn't a lot be, of sense. I wouldn't be at all surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, no, I painted uh, houses and yeah. I was with an all woman crew, a feminist painting crew. And every time we went on a site, the men there were so horrible and they would do things like they would piss in our paint cans or take a dump nice. in them. Or this one guy, we had to paint this bathroom and the night before he had urinated all over the walls. And so we went in and we started painting and of course we smelled it and we told on him because we were like, we're, we're not going to let this woman a year from now smell piss in her walls because it's very hard to get out uh, because this guy. And so that, that guy who pissed on the walls got fired and everybody hated us after that. So... <laughs> It's a real woman's story, you know? <laughs> it's, a, it's a cracking anecdote. Yes, yeah. We're the ones who can't take a joke. Right. Um, it is, though, you know I don't drink, but it's the only time in my life that I drank was when I was painting. I think there's something in paint that makes you just crave alcohol. Okay. Um, or maybe it's because it's so rough on your body. Okay. Uh, but uh, then I went into the sign business after that. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it makes okay. perfect sense. But right. no, I didn't get fired. I did have I did have a boss once say I need to talk to you in the morning and I was like you know what I'm gonna quit. <laughs> I I kind of like the way you phrased your question of what's the first job you were fired from like you thought there'd be plenty. Yeah, um, I did. I really no, did. No, 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 it's never happened. Sorry to disappoint well, you. Well, but you're like me. You're a hustler. You'll do any right. I mean, you've really worked most of your life. I do well when I was a freelancer. When I was doing freelance writing, kind of for TV and stuff. I would pretty much say yes to anything. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, two weeks into a, a TV job, I'd, I'd absolutely be hating it. You know, working on these shows like animation shows that are funded by like eight different European countries. So, you you know, you do a script and then you have to get the notes back from the French and the notes back from the Germans and the note back, notes back from the Latvians. And, you know, after eight weeks, when people are asking you to put back stuff, you took out eight drafts ago, you go, why? Just why this bears no resemblance to... Whenever I dip my toe into television, it reminds me why I write books. Yeah, it's collaborative. You know? I hate that. I well, don't want to collaborate. Collaborative is putting it politely. It, it can be writing by committee, which is sort of impossible. And yeah. once you have that sort of control that you have when you write a book. I remember when I was editing, my, working on, with my editor on my first book, and she said to me, we were arguing about some, some line, and she said, well, it's up to you, Mark. It's your book. And I nearly fell off my chair. Honestly, I went, because nobody has ever said it's up to you, it's your script in the history mm -hmm. of film or television. Mm -hmm. So to have that degree of control is, is something that's very hard to give up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, my last question in this tranche is, mm -hmm. uh, so when for, people first meet you, and you tell them a writer, what kind of novels do they think, if they don't know who you are, what kind of novels do they think you write? Well, I, I guess I don't give them time. I think I always just immediately, I don't say I'm a writer, I say I'm a crime writer, uh, uh, which quite often provokes that they think you're a kind of journalist or, or they think that you're writing about crimes you've committed. Mm -hmm. you know, a friend of mine tells this great story when he was doing an event in, uh, in Glasgow. And, and some bloke just walked up and said, well, you know, what are you doing? He was sitting there behind a pile of books. And he said, oh, I'm a crime writer. And the bloke went, oh, what have you done? And he was like, no, I haven't done anything. I haven't committed any crimes. I just write about them and, fiction, you know, fictional versions of them. Um, and then, of course, people just want to tell you all the nasty stuff that, 
that they've been involved with or that's happened to them or ask you to write their story for them. Right. And, and quite often you get that snooty, oh, I, I don't read books like that. Mm-hmm. And you think, yeah, you do. Yeah. You do. Yeah. I hate to tell you, like, have you read uh, The Handmaid's Tale? That's dystopian. Yes, I- yeah. 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 <laughs> You read Great Gatsby? There's a murder. Of course, there's there's several deaths in the Great Gatsby. Yes. Yeah, you have um, to figure it out. Yeah, I, in fact, yeah, I remember yeah. seeing I remember seeing a session at a at a, um at a literary convention once that basically this guy stood up and made the, the his contention was that there wasn't a single great modern American crime novel that wasn't at some level about that didn't have an act of violence in it. That's what he yeah. said. He didn't have an act of violence in it. And I remember somebody at that at that session going, excuse me, The Handmaid's Tale. And he went, rape. And they went, OK. And then every book, you know, every book people were suggesting, he was going, and and your point is? He, had, he, had, he made a very convincing argument for violence being at the heart of most great literature. I, I'm on board with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, let's move on to process. OK. So our friend from this photograph, Sarah Waters, Mm -hmm. Um, who's written some fantastic books. Um, She said to me once that people always ask her where she gets her ideas and she says she steals them. Uh, And she doesn't know how to answer people other than to say she steals them. So she just pretends like it's something magical. Yeah. Uh, So do you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't really remember where the, the kernel of something came from except for pretty girls because I was the first time in my life I took a narcotic because I had back pain and I had a fever dream and it was pretty girls. That's the only time I know. Okay. Um, I can remember where a few things came from and it's something I was half listening to on the radio or it's sometimes it's a couple of things that rattle around in your head and they collide and then spark off into something else. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but often, often it's a a tiny story you read in the newspaper, never a big story, just a little story that makes you go, Hey, what? That leaves you with questions, you know, and right. then and then when I when I when I start the book, I still have those questions. I don't have everything planned out, and I will discover the answers to the questions at the same time that Tom Thorne will, and then the reader will, you know. Um, my my, I must I know I've told you this story, Karen, but I, I was at a festival in Australia once uh, on stage with a famous author who I better not name. Alice Siebold was who it was, and she got asked, uh, you know, where she where she got her idea for for the lovely bones from, and she went all sort of kooky and uh you know when i don't even know what an idea is i just heard the character's voice and i channeled the voice and i'm like nah i I just don't subscribe to that kind of nonsense i'm sorry it's not it's not a mystical thing you know it's not ideas don't descend on fairy dust i'm like you know if you get taken over by characters who's doing the typing for god's sake Mm -hmm. you know you have an idea and then you make up a story um it's it's nothing mystical it's just a job you you put your backside in the chair and you go to work, you know? Yeah. I think I just forget. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, rabbit you know, hole, I forget all kinds of things, you know, I'll talk about where the idea for rabbit hole came from when we get to that tranche question. All right. Um, so people always want to know where you write. I write in the mountains. Everybody should know that by now. Mm-hmm. Where do you write? I write in this room, in this chair, at this desk. I can't, I can't write anywhere else. I mean, I have a notebook, which I might carry around with me if I'm traveling. I can't write in a hotel room. I can't write on a train. I just can't do it. I don't know. I like to have all my crap around me. My, my, I'd like to have my spooky doll and, you know, just, uh, bits and bobs. Um, so, no, here literally is where, is, is where I've written everything, pretty much. You did this. The doll's on the other side, though, Mark. No, the doll's there. No, it, it's on the other side. It moves. Well, obviously, I've got some kind of weird mirror thing. Oh, I see what you did. I see what you did. You're way ahead you didn't of me. You fall for it. I did. Oh, no, I nearly did. I nearly you did. Need some, you need some up dog. You got me. You need I'm, some not going, I'm not going that far. All right. What do you take me for? Other than this, what is the most embarrassing interview you've done? Mine was in a sauna in Finland in a towel. Top I it. Don't. No, I don't think I can top that. I don't think I can top that. I had a strange interview in a mortuary in Germany once, um, which I, where I just I just didn't want to be. Uh, but those crazy Germans. Um, Love a mortuary. No, I'm not, I, I mean, I've had so much. I, I, I guess I, the, my most embarrassing experience at any kind of book event, I think, was at a book event I did uh, about five years ago in Northern Ireland. And the new book wasn't out for like a week or so. But they had samplers. So, you know, these little sort of pamphlet sized versions of the book. And, and I've got a pile with me for the event. 
and we got to the q a at the end and i said okay anybody asks a really good question i'll give you a free a free sample of the book you know how's that and so questions come in and a guy at the front went oh i really like your audio books and i went oh thank you very much and he said uh you you know you narrate them don't you and i said yeah and he said well tell me about that so you know what's it like narrate. so anyway I, I answered his question and i went that's a great question you get a sampler and i reached down to the pile of samplers and i picked it up and he was sitting in the front row so i just lobbed it at him and as it left my hand in that sort of half second as it was flying through the air i went he's blind that's why he likes the audiobooks. It's obvious to me now that he's blind and it's too late and the book's in the air. And obviously he he had no idea that I'd thrown a book at him and it just kind of hit him. <laughs> and, oh my God, if I could, I just wanted to die. I still wake up screaming when yeah. I think about that. I don't blame you. I'm not even going to address that. <laughs> That's too hot to touch. I did terrible. though, um, Fidelis Morgan, who's a wonderful writer, um, and has some great historical fiction. I'm sure Barbara has it in her shop. Um, she was with me on a, a U.S. tour, just happened to cross over, and I had laryngitis, and she said she would do the event for me. And she's okay. she's amazing. She's like the Shakespearean-trained actress. Uh, she was with, with, like, the troupe with Glenda Jones and Celia Emery, and, and she's amazing. And uh, so we get to this Barnes & Noble, and there's 30 chairs and one person. Right. And so I say, Fidelis will be reading. <laughs> and so she's up there and this guy has this look like, oh, I would just sat down with these bags because I was tired. And she gives him this stellar performance of my book and he's just trapped there. And I was weeping. It was so hilarious to watch. Um, so I guess what we're saying is we're very cruel. Both of us are very cruel people. Very cruel. Very, very cruel. Um, what have you learned as a most valuable lesson about being successful? Uh, work hard and be lucky. Um, I, and I really think I'm not being flippant. I mean, you know, I think an enormous amount of luck is involved in getting a book deal. Um, <clears throat> we all know, we all know plenty of wonderful writers who've never had that bit of luck. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all know writers who've had way too much luck and don't deserve it. <clears throat> but once you've, once you've had that bit of luck, you know, your manuscript lands on the desk of the right agent at the right time, and then they send it out to the right publisher at the right time, and you get your deal. You've got to take that luck and run with it. You know, you've got, and you've got to work very hard. I think, you know, I'm a big believer in that expression, the harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. Because, yeah. uh, you know, it... it, it it is a business. You've got, to, you've got to treat writing like a business. You've got to remember that it is. But your role in that business is just to entertain readers. Um, I, I write to be read. I've got no time at all for writers who say, I write for me and I, I write what I want and I don't care what the reader thinks. I bloody do. I bloody care what the reader thinks. And, and when I'm writing, when I'm sitting here writing, there's a reader, which is kind of me, another version of me, looking over my shoulder as the words are appearing on the screen. Imagine it, imagining it being read because a book only exists once it's read. It's written and then it's read. That's the kind of deal you make, the deal between the writer and the reader. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, you've just got to keep trying to give the best performance you can. And I do believe it's a performance, you know. Well, I'm one of those assholes who doesn't think about my readers until, oh, the, bo until the book's ready. Yeah. No, I, uh, I it, it, when the book's ready, then I think about, I mean, you do this, you, you have certain bookstores, certain countries you go to, and you know, these readers yeah. and that that's who I think about. I'm like, boy, I hope that they like this. You know, I've, I've well, watched, I... watched them come to these things. Yeah, but I you, don't no, no, no. you do think about the reader when you're writing a book, because I know you do. There's points when you're writing, for example, you write something and you go, I know what they're going to think. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I know, and I know that because I've just read false witness. I know, you know, like in it, <sighs> OK, without giving too much away, but there's, no, you know, there's a big twist right at the end of the first chapter. Right. Mm -hmm. And you knew you knew when you'd written that you went, I know what they're going to think and that they're going to turn that they're going to get to that bit and go, holy. And you, you, you are thinking as a reader and about the reader while you're writing. Yeah, I that's true. Have, you know, because we are all readers first and foremost. foremost I guess a primary. reader. Yeah. 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 You, you are thinking of a, a reader, you know, a yin to your yang. Yeah. What's the weirdest place you've ever toured? Um, 
Finland was quite weird, actually. You mentioned Finland. Finland was quite weird. Uh, and I ended up in a in a some bizarre karaoke bar at, at four in the morning with the biggest, hairiest Finnish bloke you've ever... I mean, I'm not saying that they party hard, right? But there were a couple of Finns in the, staying in this hotel, a couple of Finnish writers. And they were a, they were a father and daughter, right? The fa- I, I'm not sure whether they wrote as a team or whether the father was the writer and the daughter was just staying with them. I can't remember. But at the end of their like weekend in this hotel, the room had to be industrially cleaned. Now, I have no idea what they were, what they were up to. But it was like they didn't, just didn't want to go to bed. They were absolute party animals. Um, so, yeah, Finland was quite a weird place um, to tour. Uh, I love Finland. Yeah, I, I mean, I like I like all of Scandinavia, but I couldn't. Finland was a bit hardcore for me. Well, it's three o'clock and it's pitch dark, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I, they're Iceland. Drinking. Iceland's great. You done Iceland? Yeah. Iceland, I absolutely adore. Um, I I, I challenge anybody uh, to find somebody from Iceland who isn't lovely. Mm-hmm. I did. I was having this argument. Funny enough, with Ian Rankin last weekend, we were on a train for about three hours. And we were talking about Canada for some reason. And I said, oh, Canadians are all so nice, aren't they? Can you think of a horrible Canadian? And he actually managed to. So I went, yeah. oh, OK, fine, strike that then. Iceland. Think of an Icelandic person who isn't nice. And he couldn't. Neither of us could. I mean, yeah, we have, we've not met that many, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Just, I'm just talking about all the Icelandic writers we know. It's only like 300,000 re- total, right? Right. Uh, so we've met a really pretty, we've probably met 10% of the mm-hmm. Icelandic population. And they're all lovely. So there Maybe you go. a Guinness Book of World Record thing. Yeah. What's the strangest question you've ever gotten? That was it. Okay, fair. Um, so rabbit hole. Uh huh. Um, which I I had a filthy joke. I'm not going to tell. Okay. Um, so you're writing from the point of view of a woman, and I have have gone on record saying it seems like a lot of guys got a note from their agent saying, "Hey, write from a woman's perspective." After me too, but you were mm-hmm. doing it before then, and I think despite yourself, you're really good at writing from a woman's point of view. Um, so why did you? Why was this story told from a, a woman with Alice, the female character? Uh, it was always going to be a woman. Um, this was quite a personal book for me because I had both a close family member and my closest friend who had spent time on a ward like the fictional ward on which the book is set. And I'd been in to that place and I just, you know, Graham Greene used to talk about how all writers have a chip of ice at their heart and maybe crime writers have quite a big chip Because even though quite a lot of the time it was uh, painful and traumatic and upsetting, um, it was also very funny, uh, Mm -hmm. darkly funny moments. But I just went, this would be the most perfect setting for a a lot room mystery. You know, this is kind of, I have to write this. And and there were times when it was quite difficult to write because of my personal associations with it. But it was always going to be a woman. And, you know, it's much easier for me to write about a a, a middle-aged bloke because I am a middle-aged bloke. Um, it's much it's much more of a challenge to write from the point of view of a 12 year old boy or a 95 year old man or in this case a, a woman in her mid 30s who's from a very different part of the country than I am and I thoroughly enjoyed it it's the first book I've written completely in the first person and if you're asking a reader to spend 400 pages you know inside the head of one character you've got to really do your best to make that character engaging not always likable because she isn't you know she's infuriating and stubborn and unreliable Hugely unreliable, but I, I wanted to try and make her engaging. So I'm, I'm, yeah, very happy I did it. Well, one thing I think that people don't talk about is mental illness is a layer, right? So if mm-hmm. you're an asshole and you have a mental illness, you're still an asshole. But if you're a nice person and you have a mental illness, you can still be an asshole, but underneath you're still a really good person, right? Yeah. And I thought you managed that separation well. I wanted to read one of your reviews um from amazon i was intrigued by rabbit hole particularly its setting blah 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 uh, it felt authentic as were alice's behaviors and thoughts i don't think this book will be for everyone but if you have an interest in mental health and crime fiction you will probably enjoy this three stars three what it's i mean like i don't even get that oh like, listen it's you a start very talking good about- review Three stars. A friend of mine, a brilliant writer called Chris Brookmeyer, and I do a kind of late night, rude show, X-rated show. And and we spend 20 minutes just reading out our one-star reviews because they are just the best. 
You know, yeah. you look down your reviews on Amazon and you and you're foolish. You're full to yourself if you do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But every so often you do. Um, but the one star reviews are just hilarious. They are my favorite thing to read out, you know. Uh, I, I've enjoyed the Thorn novels, but this is a standalone book. So stand it alone in some petrol and burn it. One star. That's one of my favorites. Oh, um, that's a good and you get, like you were talking Thank about you. before. Yeah, I thought that was one of my better ones. <laughs> you you get those ones that said, This isn't my book, it's my husband's. I haven't read it. One star. Right. <laughs> it's it's so ludicrous and yeah. preposterous that they're just they're just fun to read. Yeah. Um, but, I thought yeah. I, but I was particularly person. upset. Hey, oh, Barbara's hey, waving at us. Uh-oh. All right, I have never read anybody's Amazon reviews. Not once, not ever. It wouldn't even occur to me to go to Amazon to look for comments on books I'm reviewing. Why do you read them? I'm fascinated with it. Why, why as an author, would you even read them? It's like why, if you've, disorder, why do you bite a or... mouth ulcer if you've got it? Yeah. Sometimes you just can't. We really shouldn't be talking about Amazon when we're yeah, doing an event. True. When we're doing it's an right. event for Poison Pen. No, no, shame no, on, no. Shame I on you. Really think about Amazon. I mean, that's well, part of the deal. But... I think if you're feeling really bad about yourself, you know, it's a great way to make yourself feel worse. But also... Oh. Um, also, I think, you know, I don't really look at reviews for books when I buy them, but if there's a, a one star and there's 6,000 reviews, I always think, oh, what's going on here? There must be everybody in this guy's high school really hates him. Yeah, but you mm. have to have gone there in the first place in order to even find them. I guess that's sort of my question oh, yeah. is, why are you well, even there? A lot of times readers are really sweet because they'll say, this is what I posted on Amazon. I thought you should see it. Or they'll bring it to your attention. Well, or yeah, but they'll bring the bad ones to your attention. Yeah, There's always yeah. that real passive aggressive one where you'll just get an email that goes, shame about the New York Times. And you go yeah. and you're like, what, what? And then they'll helpfully provide a link so yeah. you can see how much the New York Times hated your book or whatever yeah. it is. And it's, I it's think no if you're a woman, they'll be like, oh, look, this your author photo, it looks like you've put on a little weight. <laughs> My one experience with it, a pair of really wonderful authors, um, I had an extra reading copy. And so at, at um, their event, at a, at a preceding event as a marketing thing, we agreed that I would give away my much treasured and very valuable advanced readers copy to somebody in the audience. I can't even remember what the event was that led to that. So in fact, this guy won it. And the next thing we know, he has not only trashed the book on Amazon, he's given away the entire plot. I yeah. mean, you know, it's like scroll and the whole bit. And I thought, you know, I'm never doing that again. You can't trust people, you know, to even, I mean, I don't care what his opinion was, but I think it was completely unfair to ruin the book for anybody who bothered, yeah. you know, to go and read it. And so I've become extremely cautious about um, I don't know if Goodreads is any different. I don't know if any of these, I mean, the only thing I care about is what I think when it comes to, you know, selling books and reviewing books. So I strip away everything that comes from the publisher. I throw it away and I never go look at, you know, any sites or anything because, you know, I, I don't want my take on a book influenced by somebody else's opinion. Hmm. Um, but I often think, you know, that authors must have some sort of self-flagellation going on. Yeah, if they we, go wouldn't be a, we wouldn't be authors if we weren't anxiety. Maybe that's true. Maybe, messes. That, maybe that's true. I'm also going to say while we're here, I've traveled extensively in Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, and Lapland. And I have uniformly found everybody to be lovely. You're just yeah. not with the debauched ones like Mark. I just, think that, I just think they're too cold. I think I they're too went cold to bother to be horrible. I a bunch of Brits on a wonderful train trip from Stockholm all the way up to Lapland and around and then over to Narvik, Norway and back down around. And the only thing that I, I took issue with is whenever we got to a city, Rob and I and another couple, we always went looking for a really decent restaurant. All the Brits ate pizza the entire time. Uh, you know, yeah. I don't know if that's like a national thing where, you know, it's the closest thing to pub food you can get, Mark, in a Norway is the <laughs> local Italian pizza. Well, the English are not known for their sophisticated palates, are they? No. Hey, let's, no. not, let's not go there. Oh, come no, on, back, let's get back to the book comment. and stop right, slagging off British food. All so right. back, back to Alice Armitage, who yes. I thought was a really interesting character. Were you, you know, did you channel Wilkie Collins at all on this? I mean, I always think of, you know, the woman in white where this poor woman is incarcerated against her will 
whatever it all is. And there's a more recent book that's come out, the name of which I can't remember, about a woman here, I think post-Civil War or something, who was put in a mental institution just because right. she was inconvenient or I can't remember uh -huh. they wanted her property or something of the sort. Right. And Alice isn't there because somebody did it to her, right? Isn't she there? No, Alice Alice is there because, I mean, I should, I should probably just summarize the plot in a nutshell. It's set on an acute psychiatric ward. There's a murder that takes place and it's investigated by a detective sergeant, Alice Armitage of the Metropolitan Police, the only problem being that she's also a patient. Now, the reason she's there is that she suffered a sort of debilitating bout of post-traumatic stress disorder after something horrible happened to her on the job. She exacerbated that with drink and drugs, uh, became psychotic and was sectioned, which I guess is what you call committed. Um, so she's, she's on this ward, she doesn't want to be, but then this murder kind of gives her a chance to sort of prove herself, um, even though nobody, nobody else in the place is taking her seriously. They don't think they sh she should be doing it. They don't. And she says right up front how unreliable she is. She's hugely unreliable. She's either just coming down off medication or just taken medication. You know, her memory's shot. She gets things mixed up. Um, so it was fun to write. And and all the characters in there, I wanted to give them all a story. And, and I guess some of the stuff in there that I promise you, the stuff in there that you think this is preposterous happened. The more bizarre stuff in there is is absolutely based on fact and things that were were said to me or that were said to my friend or you know there's some really you know you got to have a very dark sense of humor to, to work in one of those places that's for sure. Well, I felt that was really authentic because Pete, unless you've been in a, a uh, ward like that, you don't really know. You can't duplicate the bizarreness, right? No, is, no. You can be the most creative person on earth. And you yeah. cannot do because your brain is not wired that way. Yeah, I mean, it's just a completely different way of thinking. I thought you did that really well. But let's talk about sections, because most of here in America, we don't really give people the luxury of being mentally ill. We tend to incarcerate them or, right. you know, and Reagan was great when he came along. He's like, hey, let's let all these people with mental illness. Let's stop keeping them in homes and let's. I happen to have a supporter who uh, gives me a lot of money and who owns group homes. So let's try that everywhere. And let's yeah. cut all the federal funding for mental hospitals, which effectively closed all these mental hospitals, right? Mm -hmm. So half that population ended up being arrested. And, you know, because we don't have insurance, really, if you, you really have to be just really badly off, mm. For the government to swoop in and say we're gonna yes we are gonna take care of you or you have to have committed a heinous crime so let's yeah. talk tell tell americans who don't understand what <laughs> section means well the system i mean essentially uh it means when you are uh there's no other word than forcibly um uh <clears throat> taken to a place like Fleet Ward in the book. Um, and there are different there are different levels of it. Um, but at its most basic section uh, two, you're for 28 days. I mean, it's, you're, you're basically taken to a ward for 28 days until you are no longer a danger to yourself or others. Um, and you are taken care of. You are taken care of. I mean, there isn't particularly any treatment at that stage, but you are taken care of and you are medicated. Um, I mean, our, our system is, a, is, is clearly a lot, a lot better than yours, but uh, it's still woefully underfunded. I mean, mm -hmm. massively, massively underfunded. Um, and, you know, the other thing, the other thing that I wanted to reflect in the book, uh, not hopefully not in too heavy handed a way, is that the ward that I visited, um, four of the mental health nurses on that ward died in the first COVID outbreak, four. Mm -hmm. And there was not a lot of staff to begin with. Yeah. Um, so you just extrapolate from that and think how many mental health professionals died nationwide. And that that was just horrible and frightening. Um, so they, they're not nice places. You know, however, however much they're funded, they're clearly not nice places because you're dealing with an awful lot of people in pain. Mm -hmm. um, and as Alice says somewhere in the book, you know, being banged up with mad people isn't good for your health. It isn't good for your mental health. Yeah. Um, well, also, they're they're not believed, you know. Yeah. So if they do report harm or whatever, it could be something that's manifest from their mental illness, or it could be actually happening. Right, and, and, and the default is not to believe them. Well, there's one story in the book, very brief little moment in the book, where one of the characters tells Alice that she was sexually assaulted 
mm. by a member of staff. Not in this particular place, but in another place she was in. And they just said, don't be a drama queen. Don't, mm. you know, don't complain about it. Keep your head down. Don't make a fuss. You know, there's, there's a lot of a lot of strange and bad stuff that goes on in these places, you know. Yeah. Well, so because it happens in our prisons in California, there was a woman who was, was screaming, screaming, screaming all uh, like for days, just screaming until she lost her voice. And she ended up uh, taking her eye out of her its socket um, and they still didn't check on her. So that's uh, because they say, you know, especially if you're in a a very um, um, high security prison, they say, well, you shouldn't take antidepressants because you you need to get used to it. Right. You shouldn't have like. But even though our prison system is like the chief purchaser of antidepressants and antipsychotics. um, So it's just a really great way to do things. But that was one of the. the things I thought was really funny about one of your reviews, the London times blackly comic indictment of the way we treat psychological illness today. I thought, you know what, come to America. (laughs) You're living in the Ritz. There was another um, great blur before we get more into um, the plot. Uh, Mark Billingham is the master of psychology plotting and contemporary and the contemporary scene. Um, so my question is when Ian Rankin said this, how did he get all those words out with your balls in his mouth? Uh, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm actually shocked that you think a colleague, a friend and colleague would, um, look, it's all, it's always nice when you get, uh, you know, it's always nice when anybody says anything nice for heaven's sake. Um, you know, when it's somebody of, of, uh, of Ian's stature. Yeah, obviously yeah. that's great. Well, but also Look, we should point out, Ian doesn't just do that for anybody, right? And no, there's some authors it. who are like, yes to every blurb. So he's got to really believe. Yeah, we all, we all know who they are. The whole blurb yes. thing is, is a yes. massive nightmare. It's, it's, it's horrible to ask for them. It's difficult to be asked for them. Um, and I know Ian, Ian has a policy now of simply not doing it, but he will, he will say something nice on Twitter. Mm. Uh, and I yes. tried that for a while. But the minute you put something on Twitter, within half an hour, the editor of that book will be onto you going, can we use that as a quote? So it might just as well be. Um, Because you can't say, I didn't say it, because you've said it on on social media. So, and you know what? My attitude to it is I was so absurdly grateful for the quotes I got early on, um, you know, from people I massively, massively respected, that when you're asked by a new author, what does it hurt? You know, what does it hurt? If you did, if you genuinely enjoyed that book, why not say you did? Because yeah. that might mean somebody to that, something to that author, you know? Well, abs- absolutely. You have to give back. Um, but um, I want to, this is going to be like the last question because we're hitting our time limit here. That okay. was the heart music. Um, so you were in showbiz and comedy. So yeah. obviously you've, you've interacted with addicts, um, <laughs> people who have drug and drinking problems. Oh yeah. Um maybe some authors. I don't know. We can name them if you like. So, so like, you know, the, the, I think the, a core component of the fact that Alice is untrustworthy comes from the fact that she has that, not just the psychological component, but we don't believe addicts, right? right? We always think that they're lying, that there's an ulterior thing, ulterior thing. So what were you, what were you hoping to talk about with her? Cause I thought you approached it really compassionately well i i um, she doesn't have any friends basically right she's pissed them all off i mean i wrote i wrote a book a few years ago called die of shame which was more explicitly about addiction Mm -hmm. and it it's something i feel very strongly about that the closest friend i mentioned uh who spent time on a psychiatric ward was a was a hardcore addict for 30 years um and he's somebody i've spoken to about it a lot and whose opinion about it i respect enormously we you know we just treat Addiction. I mean, I'm, I can only speak for this country, but we have such a crazy attitude to it. Um, you you know, should have a war on drugs. Uh, it's been punishing fantastic addict. for us. It's the yeah. most Just ridiculous concept in the world, the war on drugs. You take, yeah. a, you take a country like Portugal that, you know, a dozen years ago now, whenever it was, just said, you know what? We are decriminalizing all drugs, all drugs. And there are people that went, what the hell do you think you're doing? Well, this is what they were doing. They lowered crime rates. They lowered the rates of addiction. They, they lowered the rates of, of HIV. All the stupid money that had been wasted on a pointless war on drugs went to creating jobs. Went to, it, was, it was such a success. 
such a massive success. Um, but people just don't want to hear that story. They just want to go, um, addicts, addicts are evil, put them in prison. You know, it's so, yeah, I, I wanted to. There's no way you can't address that to a degree in a book like Rabbit Hole. But, yeah, I think I think my attitude to the way the government treats addiction is fairly clear. I thought so. I thought you did a great job, Mark. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. So One to better up, ones. what you've done is written a locked room mystery with an unreliable narrator who is the police it is. officer. It is. Well, it's an airlocked room mystery because obviously there's an, there's an airlock involved. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess that's exactly what it is. With, with the most unreliable narrator you'll ever come across. Um, and the, the, although the ending of the book changed so many times before I... I thought I'd decided who the killer was, then changed it at the last minute. Then almost after I delivered the first draft, woke up and thought of an epilogue that changes everything. And so put that in as well, which, so the book endlessly surprised me. So hopefully it will surprise well, I those of you who read. I mean, obviously it had to be a standalone since it can't be a Tom Thorne book, but what fun for you, you know, to stretch a bit and do something that you don't well, normally write, which I think is great. Karen does the do same that. thing. She writes standalones like false. You've got to do that. You've got to do that. Different. But um, I, I, I absolutely loved it. Three stars. <laughs> and on that note, Patrick, come and tell us whether we've had any one star reviews from the audience who are probably whiplashed by now. Um, no, everybody, actually, you've had a number of people, Mark, who, who've already read the book and are chiming in about how much they loved it. Um, right. I do have a few, a few questions. Um, okay. Actually, you've just talked, sorry about the phone. Um, you just talked a little bit about this, but uh, Anne says, Mark, my favorite of your standalones is Die of Shame. Uh, which standalone for you was the most fun to write? Um. Well, fun, fun wise, <laughs> um, I, I, even though bits of rabbit hole were hard to write, I had a lot of fun I, because I was just with Alice. I was in Alice's head for the whole book and I got to absolutely adore this character. Somebody, I, I did an event the other night where somebody said, what would you say to Alice if you met her? And I, I, I wouldn't say anything. I'd just give her a big cuddle. You know, I just got to really, really like this character, even though she infuriated me and whatever. I loved being inside her head. And for those of you who like audiobooks, I mentioned earlier, the most brilliant, brilliant act. You know, that. so the, the audio producer came to me and said, oh, you know, I guess you're not doing this one. And I said, no, this needs to be a woman. And she, they said, well, any idea of any actresses? And there's a brilliant actress called Maxine Peak, And Maxine, Maxine's was the voice I had in my head when I was writing it. She's just a brilliant, brilliant actress. And I said, well, you could ask Maxine Peake. And she said, yes. And she does the most brilliant, brilliant job of bringing this character to life. So if you want to get an audio book, I'm not sure how that will work in America, whether you'll still get Maxine or Probably whether you'll not. get somebody <laughs> else. I don't know. I don't know. But I don't you know, know either. I did enjoy writing this a lot. Um, also, Karen, thanks a lot for what actually for what both of you said about the, the current state of mental health. I do have several friends who work in that industry, and I think your comments were spot on. Um, Let's see here. Anne. Anne says, Mark, have you ever seen anyone reading one of your books in public or picking up one of your books in a bookstore? And did you approach them, telling them who you are? <laughs> no, never. I mean, I have seen it and I've seen people like sitting opposite on the train. And I tell you why, because, it, because it's uh, a writer called Jake Arnott. Remember Jake Arnott? Sure, yeah. It was a wonderful first novel called The Long Firm. Uh, and, and he told this story that he got on a train about two days after his book came out and sat down and the woman opposite him was reading his book. And he was so thrilled and so excited. First book, two days it's been published. And, there, and he thought, I, I can't say anything, I can't. And the train pulled out of the station and he couldn't stop himself. He couldn't. And he leaned across to this woman and went, um, excuse me, that's, that's my book. And the woman looked at him horrified and went, Oh, I'm terribly sorry. It was just sitting here on the table when I got on the train. And she tried to push it back towards him. And he was going, no, no, you don't understand. And she went, no, please have it back. I wasn't enjoying it anyway. So that's why you should never talk to anybody you see reading one of your books. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, Mark. I, I distinctly remember you coming over very early on. It may have even been for Sleepyhead uh, at the Poison Pan. Did you tour yeah. for that book? Uh, it would have been Sleepyhead or Scaredy Cat. Yeah, it was one of the, fir the first couple of books, definitely. Yeah, yeah I remember you doing a, a, an appearance here at the bookstore and having to do a call in, a phone in to a radio program late at night uh, and you were reading. It was, it was great. I have a distinct memory of, of that. Okay. 
Um, you got a better memory than me, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? What's going on with your band uh, during COVID? Have you been able to play? <sighs> no, or? no, we haven't played at all. Um, we had a whole bunch of we, we had a kind of small tour lined up March, April last year. Um, playing music venues, playing some proper music venues, the Shepherd's Bush Empire and the Queen's Hall Edinburgh and a whole bunch of shows. Uh, obviously that was cancelled. We're hoping some of those will be reinstated. I think we're playing again in September. We've actually got a Zoom a Zoom chat tomorrow night. We, we try and all get together once a month or something just to catch up. But no, we, we can't wait to be to be showing off again. So September probably. Do you ever have guest authors like would, would could Karen come up and, and sing back up or she I'm sure I don't think I ever heard Karen sing I, I do the, I played the triangle in high school okay well there you I'm go I'm not kidding sure. I'm not I'm sure I, I played it. it yeah we've had some we've had yeah well Harder than whenever, that, whenever we're at a book festival which is quite often that we're playing in a book festival there's one number we do where we go are there any crime writers in the audience knowing there's going to be dozens and when they we we drag we always drag three or four crime writers up just to sing the backing vocals on sympathy for the devil by the rolling stones so you just have these fine fine crime writers all just going woo woo and the best one ever was when we we played in fact at harrogate a couple of years ago and because we knew she was there we said are there any first ministers of scotland in the audience so nicola sturgeon who is you know the leader of, Sc of Scotland got up and sang with us, which was an absolute treat because she's great. For the audience who may not be familiar with with this side project of yours, can you tell us tell us who's in the band? It's Stuart uh, Neville. The, Stuart Neville, who is just a genius guitarist, and not just a genius guitarist, but a genius luthier, a maker of I know, guitars. I know. And for my sixtieth birthday, two weeks ago. He made me, I didn't know about this until last weekend when I got presented with it, a beautiful handmade electric guitar wow. with, with kind of my name embossed on the headstock and uh, just the most gorgeous thing. He made it. So he, and he's a fabulous guy, Stuart Neville, Luca Veste, Liverpool writer um, on bass, Doug Johnston, Edinburgh writer on drums. And then up front, uh, riding on the coattails of those three brilliant musicians are me, Val McDermott and Chris Brookmeyer, just kind of showing off up front, really. I have actually have a really good question, maybe for both of you. Um, Allison asks, do you ever get angry or frustrated or fall in love with your characters? Well, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no, because they're always a character. I, uh, you know, it's a sort of acting exercise. You're, you're, you're putting yourself inside the head of a character and being that character, and especially when it's first person. You know, I'm walking into a room. What am I hearing? What am I seeing? What am I smelling? How am I feeling? You know, um, but it's you. It's also you. You'd be getting angry at yourself. It's kind of a strange thing. I mean, I don't mind it when readers get that close to a character. If they want to send me CDs that they think Tom Thorne would like, I'm like, great, go ahead. Um, uh, but no, I don't think I've ever actually I've ever actually gone that far because every also every hero, every character is the hero of their own story. Even the most repulsive characters I've I've written i've tried to make them human and and you know give them something that a reader can empathize with yeah no i i'm the i i feel like my characters are real people when i'm writing about them i don't i know they're me but also they're very different from me so i feel like they're they're just outside of me in a way do you do you wonder what's happened to them when the story's finished yeah i do or i'll hear okay. a song and i that i don't particularly like and i'll think that character likes that song yeah, but we should say, Mark, with all your side project uh, projects, Die of Shame also is the name of one of your sex tapes. <laughs> Any is that more available questions? as an audio book, Mark? Sorry? Is that available as an audio book? It's in Braille. Die of Shame, yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Sounds terrific. Uh, Carl, Carl just said, did Mark just say Val McDermott is in his band? Yes, yeah. he did. <laughs> yeah, it's quite I, there's actually story, photos yeah. of her you can find. She's like the, the lead singer. Um, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, there's video evidence, uh, plenty of video evidence online if you want to look it up. And what's the name of the band again? The Fun Loving? The Fun Loving Crime Writers. Fun Loving Crime Writers. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, I Our think that's flick. about it. Um, but I right. just wanted to chime in also about uh, Mo Hader. I appreciate so much what you both were saying. What a, what a tremendous talent. 
Yeah. Patrick and I agree that The Rape of Nanking was an absolutely stupendous yeah. novel. Yeah. Um, so it is nice. Patrick is down in the middle of the bookstore because the air conditioning failed upstairs and, you know, okay. it's Phoenix in August. So for those of you who are wondering, that's Bill running around behind him, our store manager, and Julie, who's the, Julie. yep. So it's kind of busy. Anyway, this has been a real treat. Thank you so well, much, thank, Karen. Thank it's you very much, Evans, and thanks for doing this, Karen. Um, oh, I'll see you next time, Mark. Thank you. You will. Thank you. Indeed. Cheers, Barbara. Thank you, Patrick. It's really been a great pleasure, Mark. So could we remind you that we have copies of Rabbit Hole, U.S. edition, and the U.K. autograph edition for Mark, yeah. since he unfortunately couldn't make it across the pond. It was the best we could do for you readers who like signatures. And we definitely have more copies of False Witness, Karen's amazing new book, um, and so, you know, if you've enjoyed the talk, please support them by buying a book. We'll have a podcast available of this unexpurgated, unedited tomorrow or possibly later today. And um, the video will live forever. So if you think you know someone who would enjoy listening or viewing it, be sure to tell them. So au revoir. I hope we'll see you again very soon. Bye. Bye. Have a rest of your day. Thank you. Good night.